In this intermediate React course about React state management, Jack Harrington will teach you about hook state, context, using request libraries for state management, Redux, and more. Hi, I'm Jack Harrington. I'm a principal full stack software engineer, and I am super excited to be here on Free Code Camp talking about my favorite topic, which is React state management. And the first thing I want to answer about React state management is <laughs> what is state management? So State management is basically half of your React app. When you think about it, you've got the presentation side of the house, that's the HTML and how you format it. And then there is the data that's in your application, the state. And to me, state and state management is the beating heart of a React app. And why do I say that? Well, it actually is. The only time a React app will re-render is when state changes, when you add an item to a cart, when you remove an item from a cart, that's the time when the React app re-renders. And so state is the engine that moves your React app. In fact, I would go so far as to say that React's whole job is to turn state into HTML, at least in the web context. So in this video, I'm going to give you a complete overview of all of the different ways that you can manage state in your React application. And that's going to start off with React's native state management. This is the hooks we've all come to know and love. Things like use state, use reducer, use memo, and use effect. We are going to drill in deep on these hooks and make sure that we really understand them because they are the foundation upon which all of the other state management models are built. In the second section, we're going to talk about indirect state managers. These are third party libraries like React Query, React Location, React Router. It's not their primary job to manage state, but React Query, for example, it goes off and it queries data from the server and it gets it back. And now it holds that data, which is in effect managing that state. And perhaps the combination of native hooks and one of these third party libraries like React Query or React Location is enough for your state management needs for your application. And then in the third section of the video, we're going to talk about direct state managers. These are third party libraries whose sole function is to manage state. Things like Redux, Jotai, Valshio, and Zushdan. And we'll talk about the different models and which one you might want to select for your application. And then at the end, we'll talk about some new things that are coming with some React RFCs that are just coming out in Next.js 13 that change the way that we think about how we might want to manage state in our application. And I'll sum up by giving you some recommendations about what I suggest you might think about in terms of choosing state management technologies for your app. But it all starts with getting to know React hooks really well. So let's get right into it. So we're gonna start off by taking a look at native state management in React and in particular, concentrating on the use state hook. So to do that, I'm going to build a Vite application. I'll do that using yarn create Vite. Then you give it the name of the application that you want. So I'm just going to use native use state. And now Vite, which is an awesome way to create web applications, can take multiple templates. I'm going to use the template for React. All right, now I'm going to bring that up in VS Code. All right, so here we have our application. I'm going to bring up the console. And then I'm going to do yarn to install all the dependencies, and then yarn dev to start it up. And I'll click on this link. And there you go. Awesome. Here is our application. It's even got a little bit of interactivity, a little state in this case. But we're just going to remove everything that we see here to start. So where is that located? Well, that's located over at nap.jsx. And I'm going to remove pretty much all of this. But we'll keep around use state because we know we're going to need it. OK, so the first thing we want to do is experiment with using a numeric state, a number. And actually, a counter is the best way to do that. So we're going to basically re-implement this from scratch. Now, all of this code is available to you on GitHub for free in the link in the description down below. But you can just follow along me, if you please. So OK, 
So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna define that we have some state associated with this component. So to do that, we say use state. And we'll start our counter off at a given number. So let's start with 10. Now the output of use state is an array. So let's go and get that array. And within that array, the first item is the current value of that piece of state. So we'll call that count. And then the second item is a setter function. You call that function to set that piece of state. So we'll call that set count. Now let's create a button that has the count. And let's take, take a look, see what it looks like. All right, so we've got a button down here, kind of hard to see a little bit, but it's got 10 on it, but it doesn't do anything yet. So we want to create an on click. So how do we do that? We'll use on click and then we give it a function. So we're going to say add one is our function. And then we'll define that function. So here's a mistake that I've seen people do. I've seen people do count plus plus. And I think the idea is that, well, count is just a count. And when I set it, it should be retained. So let's try that out. Let's see if that actually works. So I hit click on that. Nothing happens. And so why is that? Well, we're seeing that we're getting this assignment to a constant variable. Now what's outputting that is actually console ninja. If you want to go grab that. That's from the folks at Wallaby. There's a link to that also in the description down below. It's free and it's super handy like this. So well, okay, we get it. This is defined as a const, right? So let's go and redefine that as a let, and maybe that will work. All right, let's give it a try. Now I click, still doesn't work, but we don't get an error. Interesting. Okay, so why is this? Well, learning why this is, is really critical to understanding pretty much all of state management in React. So I wanna spend a, a bit of time on it. And one of the things that I wanna do is I wanna use a workbook to show how this is actually working. So I'm going to go create in a, another extension called Quaka, a worksheet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function that returns a value, kind of like use state. So we'll call that function get state. And let's say that it has some value in it, say 42. And then when you call get state, it just returns that value. Now down here, I'm gonna call get state. Now currently it just returns 42, but I'm gonna go store that somewhere. So I need to store that in a new value. So like my value. And we'll just ask Quaka what my value is. It's 42. And now if I set it to something else, Now my value is 22. Cool. But what happens when I go and get the state again? So I'll say my value again. And now my value again is still 42 because setting the value of a return just sets your local copy. So scalars, and that includes strings, numbers, and booleans. So a number in this case, are returned and passed by value, where arrays and objects are passed and returned by reference. And there's a huge difference there. So when you're returned something by value, you don't get it, you get a copy of it, which is not the same thing. Now you could say, oh, Jack, you know, you, you got it all wrong. This is returning an array. Okay, fine. Let's go try the same thing with an array. There you go. So we see that again, my value is 42. We set the local copy to 22. And then we again set that and there's no difference. Same sort of thing down here, right? All we're doing is just destructuring a scalar within an array. Now there actually is a way to kind of make get state do this. And that's the beauty of JavaScript and closures. But when you hack around that much, you're not actually representing how React is actually managing state. And the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in this doesn't work. So what works is to use that set count function that's given to us to set that count to be the count plus one 
or whatever you want. So let's go over here and try it again. And now it works perfectly. So now I mentioned that count is associated with this particular instance of this component, but this component is the app, right? So we only have one. So what if we were to have multiple ones of these? So let's go and take app and just rename it counter. And then we'll make a new app that will just make a bunch of counters and see how that works. Now we have one counter down here. Let's go make a bunch. Cool. Now we've got four count buttons and now we can click on each one of them and they all independently set. And that's what I mean by the state being coupled with the instance of that component. Each one of these components, these counter components maintains its own count. And thus going back over here, we can go and independently mutate each one of these and they all maintain their states individually. So we talked about how to manage a scalar, a simple scalar using use state. Well, let's talk about how to manage an array. So we do that a lot as well. So I'm going to create an array of names, and then we're going to have an ability to add a name to that. So let's get rid of one, all these counters. And I'll create a new function, which is a component called name list. So let's create some state to hold that list of names. Jack. Jill and John. In fact, actually, let's go fix this to be const again. So that's good. Okay, good. And now we're going to render that state. Nice. And let's go and actually put it into our app. All right, good looking list there. All right, so we want to be able to add an item to that array. So we need an input field. So that's another thing you can do. You can have multiple pieces of state associated with the same component. So we're just going to have another piece of state called name, which is a scalar string. And then we need an input field. Now, when this text changes, we get an event and that event has a value for the current target, the target of that event being that input. And within that target, we have the current value. That would be the last thing that the user typed or the last state of the text field. So we just set the name to that target value. And again, we're using the setter, right? We don't want to go and say name equals target value because we know for strings and for numbers and booleans, we get back copies. We don't get back the real thing. So we can't just set it. We got to use that setter set name. So now we've got our set. Let's go take a look and see if that works. Seems to work pretty well. Cool. So now let's go and add a button so we can add an item to the list. Now we need to add a click handler that is going to respond to clicking on add name to add that name to that list. Okay, so here we have add name. So how are we going to implement on this? Well, what we could do is we could just say push the name onto list. All right, let's go check this out. I'm going to go and add some just random text in there. I'll hit add name and nothing happens. But here's an interesting deal. If I change the state of the component, we'll get a re-render. So if I hit backspace, that's going to change the state of the name field, which calls set name. Set name then does two things. It sets the name and it also enqueues a re-render request for this particular component. When the re-render happens, we get that same list and then we print it out. Now that's the big difference here between scalars and references. So strings, numbers, and booleans are scalars. You get back the value, a copy of the value, and then that's it. You got the local copy. But when it comes to objects and arrays, JavaScript manages those by reference. And when you give React a reference to this particular array, it then holds not the array 
data itself, but it holds a reference to that array. And then it gives us back that same array reference. We then use an in place command push to mutate that data of that array in place. And that's why as we add more items, when we do a refresh, we actually get that updated data. The problem is that React has no idea that we've done that. So the second part of what a setter does, which is to enqueue a request for a re-render of the component, doesn't happen. So what if we did this? What if we said set list and we'll just give it the same list again? I mean, hey, you know, we've made a change, which is, you know, just, just, just go and re-render. Okay, let's try that. So hit refresh, add the name again, and nothing happens. So here's the deal. When I call any setter, when it comes to use state, it looks at the old value and it looks at the new value. And if the old value and new value are the same, it just says, I don't, I don't care. Thanks, but you know, I didn't, you know, you're not really doing anything. So what we're doing in this case is we are giving it back exactly the same reference as we had before. So it's looking at those two references and saying, oh, that's the same array. And so you're just asking me to do nothing really. And so it doesn't enqueue a re-render request. So what we need to do in order to make this work is instead of in place mutating the array, we create a new array that has the contents of the old array plus the new name. So the way that we do that is we create a new array. We give it all of the old array, so list in this case, and then we give it our new name. Now we don't have to do that push anymore. Hit save, and away we go. Even better, we can do set name and set that to an empty string. Then after we add it, that's set to an empty string. And it's important to know that with React 17, with React 18, these setters are batched. So you do set list, it sets that value, it enqueues a request, set name runs right after that, sets that name, again, enqueues a request to re-render the component. React says, hey, I've already got one for this component, and it just ignores it. And then when the re-render comes around, both of those values have been set. Now, the last thing I want to cover about use state before we move on to use reducer is that use state also can take a function as a starting point. So let's just take our example here of a simple string, and then we'll give it a function. And that function will return a string that says Jack. And there you go. Now it's initialized to Jack. So the value of doing it this way is that if you've got some sort of complex calculation that you need in the creation of this use state, you can do it all within that function. And that function will guaranteed only ever get run once when that component is first created. Let's continue to take a look at native state management in React by taking a look at use reducer, which is another way to store state in connection with a component, just like use state. All right, let's go and create another example application. We'll call this one native use reducer. And again, this is available to you in the GitHub repository associated with this video. And I'll bring it up in VS Code. Let's install it and then run it and bring it up in the browser. Okay, it looks good. So let's pare this down again. Okay, we're all cleaned up. But before we get into use reducer, I do want to talk a little bit about a reducer function in general. And a good way to do that would be to open up a TypeScript workbook and look at the reduce method on an array. So let's give ourselves an array of numbers and we want to total up those numbers. So let's start with the total and then we'll iterate through all the numbers and then add that to the total. And eventually, well, what do we get? We get 60, 10 plus 20 plus 30, 60. I think that makes sense. 
All right, so another way to do that is to use a reducer function. So numbers has a function on it called reduce. And that reduce function takes two parameters. It takes a reducer function, which returns something, and then it takes an initial value. So our initial value here would be the same as this total. We start off at zero, so that's easy enough. So this reducer function takes two parameters. It takes the current value, which would be zero to start, and then it takes the number at the given index as it indexes through the entire array. So it starts off at 20, 10, 20, and 30. So we'll call that n. And the output of a reducer is the new value for the next iteration. So in this case, we want to take the existing value, so starting at zero, and then add on each number as we go through. Now, if we look at this, we get 60 as the output. How cool is that? So this function right here that we pass to reduce is called the reducer, and it takes two parameters. It takes the current value, and then it takes some new value. And in the case of numbers, because we're iterating through an array, it takes each one of the numbers as we go through. And then the output, of a reducer is what the next iteration's input will be. So this reducer pattern is gonna show up in two places in this video. It's gonna show up in the use reducer example that we're gonna build here, and it's also gonna show up in Redux. So learning how reducers work is beneficial across state management. Okay, so what do we wanna do with use reducer here? Well, we wanna rebuild this example of a list of names and then an input name and build it all in one piece of state management. And so we'll bring in user reducer and we'll invoke it. And the first thing let's decide on is what's gonna be in the state. So the state is going to have a list of names, start off with an empty array, and then it's going to have the current name, which will just be an empty string. And that is going to be the state. So use reducer, just like use state, returns an array. That array has two elements to it. The first is the current state. So in this case, that would be this object here. And then it also returns a dispatch. And that's a way to invoke the reducer function that we're going to add. So let's create our reducer function. And the reducer function takes the existing state, which I'll just name state. And then it'll take some sort of action, right? And that's what's going to be sent to that dispatch. So we'll just call that action. So by convention, action is usually an object and that object has a type on it. And then you use that type in a switch statement to then mutate that state and return a new state based on the data that you get with that action. So let's just start with setting that name. So we'll create a switch statement and we will switch on a type, which comes in from that action. So when we dispatch, we're going to dispatch an object that has a type on it. And then we'll create a case and let's call this one set name because we, our first thing is we want to be able to set that name for that input field. So let's do set name. And now we want to return a new version of state. So we take all of the existing state and then we have a name that comes in on a key called payload. And that's a kind of by another convention. You can really rename these keys all you want, but it's very common to see type and payload. So the second value that comes out of this array is dispatch. And we're going to use that when it comes to our input. So let's go create the input here. So we're going to have an input where the type is text. And the value is the name that comes out of here. So that right there, we get state name, and that gives us state.name. And then the on change, we are going to dispatch, and then we're going to give it an object. And that object is going to have a type. That type is going to be checked here. We're going to pass set name, and then we're going to give it a payload. And that payload is again that target value. So the target of the event is this input. And then dot value is going to give you your current value. So let's take a look, see how we go. And you know what? Just to check it, let's go and add in a div where we 
output the current state name. All right, let's have a look. Okay, so we've got our input field over here. Hello, oh, nice. So what's actually happening here? So what's actually happening here, let's kind of walk through it step by step, is we have an input field, it has the current name on it, and then every time we get a change event, which tells us we have some sort of new text, we dispatch to this reducer function, a type of set name and the payload. That then gets given the current state, which we know is going to be this names as an empty array, and then the current name, whatever that is, and then an action. That action has that type in it, set name, and then we just create a new object with that state and that payload. But let's talk about that whole references and scalars thing and mutating a reference in place. So let's just say that we're not gonna do that. We are going to instead just return state. And we'll just set the name to that payload. Let's see what happens. Refresh, we type, and nothing happens. And again, this is because React is looking at the reference that's coming out of use reducer and saying, hey, this matches the existing reference. So it can't see. It's not going to compare by contents. It's not going to look at the inside the object and say, look, the name is different between these two things. It's going to look at the reference to the object. So that's why we have to create a new object here and then just mutate the fields that we want to mutate. So we return all of the existing fields, which mean all of names, and then we just override the key for name and change it to whatever's coming in off that payload. So now we need to allow for the customer to add an item to the array. So let's create a new case called add name. And we're going to turn another new object. That new object is going to have all of the existing state. Again, that includes names and names, but we're going to override names to be a new array that has all of the existing names in it, plus the name that we send with the payload of this action. And I think actually also we should just reset the name too. There. See how easy that is? We can actually mutate multiple fields at the same time. It's pretty cool. All right, let's go down here and we will make a button out of this. Call this add name. And with that on click handler, we will then dispatch add name. And you know what? Actually, we don't really even need a payload here because we already have the state. So let's go and just do add name. So this is going to be state.names. We already have just state.name there. Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, cool. So I think that's really clean, right? All you're doing is basically say, hey, just add the name. Okay, let's take a look. Add name, and now we don't really know, maybe it added, maybe it didn't, at least it removed the existing name, so that's a plus. So let's go and see what we have in that list of names to see if we actually added a name. Hey, pretty cool. So as you can see, use reducer is a nice way of managing more complex state. So in this case, we have an object that has two keys in it. You can imagine you would have an object that would have a lot of data in it, a lot of different keys. This would be a much nicer way to do that. And you could go and take this reducer, pull it out of the component code itself, and then test it independently and not have to worry about testing it through a React component. So I think it's actually a really nice way if you have complex state to model that. All right, now one more trick I wanna show you when it comes to use reducer. I really like this one. So let's go and call this name list and then we'll make another app component and we'll use name list in there. Okay, so we're gonna go and make ourselves a little user form. And in here, we're gonna have two input fields, first and last name. So let's make a div. And then within that, we'll have an input type as text 
And at this point, we'll just say that our value is going to be some state at state.first, and then we'll have state.last. Okay, so let's use a reducer for that. So we'll say use reducer. And we won't specify our reducer function quite yet. Let's go and set our initial state to have first and last. And then we'll get that state as well as a dispatch. All right, great. Okay, cool. So let's uh, invoke user form here and see if it works. Nice. We have two fields there, but they don't do anything. So here's the trick, and I really love this one. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine the state, the existing state, with whatever comes in on the action. Just like that. It's so easy. In fact, actually, we can make it just a little bit easier. How cool is that? And now what we can do is over here in our on change, we can just dispatch with whatever key we want to change. So we send first, then first overrides just first, but everything else remains the same and the same with last. So let's give this a try over on last. And now you have two fields and let's prove it out. Let's go and put uh, two divs down here. First is first step. Is state dot first, and we'll make a new div for last. Perfect. <laughs> That's sweet. So you don't have to have a whole raft of state functions. Using this little pattern here, you can manage very easily large object state and make all the mutations that you want. It's a nice pattern when it comes to use reducer. All right, so next up, we're going to take a look at two ways to observe state, use callback and use memo. So now that we know how to declare state using use state and use reducer, let's talk about three hooks that allow you to monitor state. That would be use memo, use callback, and use effect. And in this part of the video, I'm going to cover just use memo and use callback. So let's talk about use memo because I think it's actually the most simple yet somehow the most misunderstood. So I like to think of use memo as use calculated value. So let's take a simple example of a list of numbers. So here we've defined some state. We've got 10, 20, and 30 in there in our array, and we want to total it up. And in fact, we want to use that nifty reducer pattern that we saw before. So how do we do that? Well, we could just do something like this. We take numbers, we call reduce on it. Then with that accumulator starting at zero, we add each number in succession to that accumulator, return the new accumulator, and then that gives us our total. So we just, we can actually just put that down in here. But of course I need to ring in use state, so let's do that. And now let's see, look, oh, there we go, total 60. So 10, 20, 30, together is 60. Makes sense. Now, imagine, if you will, if this array was monstrous, huge, crazy huge, thousands of values. Well, we wouldn't want to recompute that any time that app re-rendered, which is what's going to happen here. Every time React re-renders our component, the entire function gets called. So what we want to do is we only really want to recalculate total when numbers changes. So let's bring in our friend use memo or use calculated value, as I like to call it. So how does use memo work? Well, use memo takes a function, and that function does the calculation. So let's do that first. All right, so far, so good. And then it takes a list of dependencies in an array. And this is where a lot of folks get into trouble. So basically, anything that you read from should go into the dependency array. So in this case, we are reading from numbers, and that means that we want to put numbers in the dependency array. And what this will do is it will only calculate this total. It will only run this function 
anytime numbers changes. And in this case, numbers won't change because we initialize it, but we don't actually add anything to it or change it in any way. So let's run it again. And there we go. So there are two times when you want to use use memo, and this is a really good example of one of them. The first time you want to use use memo is when you're calculating any value and the process to create that value, it might take a while. So any kind of complex calculation that you want to do. And in this case, numbers could be arbitrarily large. So that qualifies. So no matter what the output is, if it's a number, a string, a Boolean, another array or an object, that's fine. You want to use use memo whenever you've got a complex calculation that you don't want to do on every render. You want to just be smart about it. You want to make sure that you only run it when you need it. The other time you want to use use memo is when you're creating an array or an object. And that's because React compares arrays and objects by reference. And so it's important to stabilize references as we've seen before in the start of this video. So references are really important and you want to keep those stable. So let me show you an example of that. So we'll start off with a list of names. Perfect. The Beatles, John, Paul, Jordan, Ringo. I love <laughs> GitHub Copilot. It's awesome. And now let's go and sort those. So we'll create sorted names. And you know what? We'll just do an in place sort. And then let's output that. So now I've got the names, but you know what? I also want to put the sorted names there. All right, let's take a look. Uh, okay, well, let's actually just join that all together using a comma. Okay, all right, so we've got a good sorted names down here, but we actually have the same sorted list up here. So why is that? I mean, we start with John, Paul, Jordan, Ringo, and then actually names. Uh oh, okay. So what's actually happening here is that sort is doing an in place sort. It's actually mutating names in place. So yeah, we're getting a copy of the reference to that array, but that array has been sorted. So the first thing we want to do is actually copy names before we sort it. And then we sort the copy. All right, so now this looks good. We have our original names and we have our sorted names and our original names haven't been touched. So let's go back to the code and let's see. So this is good, but every time this component re-renders, it's going to rerun this sort. Now that's not particularly bad in this case because app is only gonna render the once. So let's go and put in a use memo around this. And again, we'll make this a function. And so what does this depend on? Well, it depends on names. So names changes, we want to rerun that sort. So this use of use memo falls into both categories of when I think it would be important to use use memo. First, it's an expensive calculation, potentially. You could have a very long list of names and you don't wanna rerun that sort on every single re-render. Awesome. It also falls into my second category, which is that it results in an array or an object. So this is a really good use of use memo. Let me tell you about when I don't think you should use memo. And that's for very simple calculations. For example, let's think about adding two numbers together. So now we've got count one and count two. I'm going to go add buttons for those. All right, looks good. Let's go to try. Perfect. And now we want to get a total of these two. So right now that'd be around seven, right? So let's go and make a total. So I'm going to create a count total. And I'm going to start off by using a memo and have it add count one to count two. And then I'll just put that in the div down here. Hey, nice. Okay, cool. I even got back to seven. How cool is that? All right. So this is not a good use of use memo. And it's because the calculation is simple and it results in a scalar, a number, a string or a Boolean. So you don't really have to use it at, in this case, it's really just overhead in this case. So all you need to do is just do an in place count one plus count two. That's it. So now that you know what use memo is, let's talk about some of the myths around it. 
The first myth around use memo is it is somehow connected to React memo. The two are in no way related. So I'm not sure how that happened. I guess somebody was like, use memo, thinking of like somehow React memo, but it's it's not that. It's just use memo is its own thing. Again, think like use calculated value and React memo, which memoizes components and is a good performance enhancement in certain circumstances is just completely really unrelated. So the other myth that I've heard about use memo is that it is a performance killer. And I'm not really sure where that comes from. I think it might come from the CS concept of memoization. So with classic memoization, you memoize a function and then that memoized function remembers every single set of parameters that's sent to it. And it, only if it sees a new set of parameters is it calculate a new value. Otherwise it will send back a value from that cache that it has. And that cache could get huge. It could get crazy. The potential number of parameters you can send to it, the combinatorics, you can just get like a big data in memory hit. Use memo doesn't do that. Use memo is a single level memoization. All it's doing is basically saying, Hey, let's look at this dependency array. Is the dependency array the same as the last time that I saw it? If it is, then I'm just going to give you back the last value that you created. Otherwise, I'm going to allow you to create a new value for the new data. And then I'm going to hold on to that. But it's only a single level. So there really isn't any kind of performance or memory hit when it comes to use memo. All right, let's talk about use callback. So use callback is another kind of misunderstood hook. People don't use it when they should, should use it when they don't need to. <laughs> Let's try and demystify it a little bit. Okay, so we have this list of names, right? John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And we have a assorted names use memo. So let's go and create a generic component that sorts in a list of incoming strings. We'll call it sorted list. You give it a list of strings and it sorts them and then displays them. So first let's grab this use memo down here. We're going to need that. And so it's now the sorted list and it will depend on list. And then we will return a div that has our sorted list joined. Cool, right? So let's go down here and replace this sorted names with a sorted list and we'll give it the list, which is our names. And it looks really good and it's doing its sorting and everything still works. So looks good. So I want to see how often this sorted list runs. So I'm going to make this into a curly brace function and just return that sort. And I'll put it in my console log. Cool. And we can see that we are running the sort twice, but that's because we're actually mounting the component twice. That's a React 18 thing. When you're in dev mode and strict mode in React 18, every component gets run twice. So that's not a big deal. But let's go and click on all these buttons and we can see that we're not getting run anymore. This component is re-rendering. I can add that too. sorted list render. And now we can see that every time I click this count, we do get a sorted list render. You can see that's 20 right there. We're getting 20 times that call. By the way, this is console ninja that's putting in the console in context like that. It's a really e excellent extension and it's free. You should try it out. So, okay. So now let's go and say that we want to make this sorted list a little bit smarter. We want to be able to give this sort function, a, a sort comparator. So let's say that you want to do your string sorting somehow slightly differently. So we're going to allow you to have a sort function. And we're going to send that sort function on to sort. And now we've got to define that sort function. So down here, we will define our sort function. And we will say that we are going to take two strings and we're just going to compare the two and we'll pass that sort function onto our sorted list.
Nice. And so the sorting still works. In fact, we can, let's see, just multiply this by negative one. And now we get the inverse. We get Ringo, Paul, John, and George. But we've actually messed up because we don't have our sort function in our list of dependencies. Because if sort function were to change, if we were to give it a different algorithm, we would want a different result. So let's go and add that to our list of dependencies. So now let's hit this button a couple of times. And now we can see that every single time we render, we also run sort. So what's happening there? Well, what's happening there is that every time that we rerun app, which is every time we click that button because we set the state, the state then says you need to NQ a re-render of the app component that then reruns this whole component all the way down the line. And we create a sort function and then we pass it on to our sorted list. And now the sort function is the same implementation each time. We're not changing the implementation, but we are changing the reference every time. We're creating a new function every time that we go through this. Now, is it any different if I were to do this? Is there some magic in React that will make it so that that's not a problem? Well, let's try. Nope, still gets called every single time. So there's no difference between doing it in line like this and having it called out like that. So how do we stabilize the reference to that sort function so that when we get down here to our dependency array, we keep seeing that the sort function is the same every single time. Well, one thing to do would be just to pull this out of the function entirely, put up there. Now I've got this global sort function, give it a try. All right. So that works. We're not getting a complete one-to-one -one map between rendering and running that sort, but I'm not super happy about having this outside of the component like that. I don't think that's all that clean. I'd rather have it where I had it before, right, right in the component. So how do we do that? Well, we can use use callback for that. So we can wrap this function and use callback. And then what's the dependency array? Well, the dependency array in this case is empty because we're not actually using any data that's in this function. We're not using total or names or count or any of that. This is just a simple stock comparison function. We just want to make sure that that reference remains the same over time. So we're just going to use an empty dependency array there. That way we only ever create sort func once. Let's hit save, try it again, hit a bunch of counts. And there we go. Now we have a stabilized version of our sort function and we will only ever call sort list appropriately if the list changes or the sort function changes, but we're not going to rerun it on every single go. So that's why use callback is important. So when should you use use callback? We should use use callback if the callback that you're creating, like the on click or the on change or whatever is going on to a nested component as a property. So in this case, we're passing sort function as a property to the sorted list. And you don't know the internals of sorted list. Maybe it depends on that sort function. And if that sort function reference changes, it's going to go and update. So make sure that you stabilize references that you send to a react component. If you're just using a simple HTML element like input, you don't need to use use callback for something like on change. It's overkill. The other time that you want to use use callback is if you are creating a custom hook, which we'll get to in just a bit. Anytime that you create a callback in a custom hook, you want to make sure that you use use callback to do that because you have no idea what the component that's going to use that hook is going to do with that callback. And you want to make sure that the reference to that callback is absolutely stable over time. All right. So the next thing we're going to take a look at is everybody's favorite hook use effect. So let's talk about use effect. Everyone's favorite hook. It's not actually that complicated, but it does have a lot of foot gun potential. In fact, it's the hook that is the one that's most often the culprit when it comes to 
infinite loops inside of React apps. So let's talk about how to do it right and how to avoid those pesky infinite loops. So we have a Vite app here. It's called Native Use Effect. It's checked into the GitHub repo in the source linked in the description down below. And this is our starting point. So it's just a standard Vite app. Currently it outputs nothing. But we do have some extra stuff in here. In the public directory, we've got a list of names, Jack, Jill, and Jane. And then we have corresponding JSON files for each one of our people. Not a particularly great API, but one of the things that we use useEffect for a lot is to make API requests. So let's do that. Let's actually use a combination of useState and useEffect to fetch the names. So first we have to define our data, that would be our names. We'll start off with an empty array and then let's just print it out. Let's take a look. And now I currently have names with nothing because we have an empty array over here. So let's go populate that array. Well, one way we could do that would be to do fetch right here. Let's go and get our names.json. Then we get our response back and then we set the names. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Let's take a look. And there they are. <laughs> oh wait, hold on. What's going on here? Uh Oh, oh wow. Yeah, we blew up. So here's what's happening. So we render app app then declares that state names, then starts a fetch, then that goes off and asynchronously runs. We then return our HTML with our names in it. Eventually this fetch responds. We then get this asynchronous then where we get the JSON out of it. That again, asynchronously responds. Then we do this then here where we then set the names, which starts the whole process over again, because what set names does, as we know from before, it sets the names as state and it enqueues a re-render, so it redraws the names, which in turn runs app, which in turn now goes and gets the new names that we got. So yay, we're cool, good for that. But then we start another fetch right away. And so we're in an infinite loop. So how do we get around this? Well, we use use effect. And use effect would allow us to say, hey, only go do this thing once. So what does use effect do? Well, it takes a function that it is going to call once the DOM is rendered or really whenever React wants to call your use effect, but it's not going to call it right away. It's going to hold it and then call it whenever it wants to, when the dependency array changes. So let's put our fetch inside that. And then for a dependency array, we'll just use an empty dependency array. We're not depending on anything. We're not reading anything inside of this use effect. So we don't have to put anything into the dependency array. So let's save that out and see, is this going to work? Ah, bingo, it works. And it's rock solid stable. How cool is that? Yay. Now it actually does go and fetch names.json twice. So let's talk a little bit about why that's happening and why that's not really a super huge problem. So what's happening is with React 18, every time you, it renders a component in dev mode with strict mode enabled, it mounts it, which renders it. It unmounts it, which in the case of a use effect should call a cleanup function if we define one, but we haven't defined one here. And then it remounts it again. And that remounting calls that use effect again. So we get called twice. And a lot of people freaked out about this and wasn't very, weren't very happy about it, but that's what it is. So if you want to not do that, you can actually disable that by removing strict mode from your app over in the main.jsx. Again, this only happens in dev mode. It's not gonna happen in production, but a lot of people got tweaked about it. So there we go. So let's try it again. Refresh, and now we only get names.json the once.
All right, now the use effect that we have here is not an infinite loop. This is a solid use effect, a good pattern. Let's go and kind of build on this by taking names and turning it into a list of buttons. And then we click on the button, we'll go and load the corresponding data, and that will show us how to use a dependency array with our use effect and do it safely. So we'll start off by mapping our names into buttons. We'll turn these into buttons. So now when we click on one of these, we want to say that that is our new selected name. So we need some state to store that. So let's call that selected name. And we'll start it off at null. And then if you click on that button, we're going to set that selected name to whatever name you just clicked. And just to check if this works, let's put that in a div down here. Jack, Jill, Jane, perfect, works great. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we want to go and get the data when this selected name changes. So let's go and build a use effect where we look at selected name and then we fetch whatever name that is. So we'll use a template string here and then we'll give it the selected name.json and let's see, so we need some place to store the data. So we need a data for that selected person. We'll call that selected name details. And so down here, instead of set names with the response back from the JSON, we'll do set selected name details. And we'll just take that data. Cool. And now we've got our data in there. Let's take a look. So put it in the div down here. And we will JSON stringify that because it's an object and React doesn't like when we just render objects directly. So let's JSON stringify that. Put in our selected name details and see what we get. All right, so we start off with null. That's good because we start off with our selected name details as null over here. And then as we click on Jill, we set the selected name to Jill that then triggers this use effect because this selected name, which is now Jill, is different from what we had before, which was null. So we had an array with null in it. Now we have an array with Jill in it. And so that triggers that use effect. But here's an interesting little side note. We also got a null.json request. So what the heck's up with that? Well, what happened there is that we started off with the selected name at null, and then we came down here and React said, hey, cool. So we're loading. We don't know what was in that dependency array before. We didn't have a dependency array before. So whatever you're gonna have in here is gonna be different. So the dependency array had an array with null in it. And so it ran you that our use effect with a selected name at null, which is not what we want. So all we need to do to get around that is then to just bracket this in an if, and say, well, hey, only go get the data if we actually have a selected name. So there we go. But now that I've shown you all this, this is actually the wrong way to do it because really we are responding to a user event here. We're doing this on click. We have our data right there. What we should do is we should do it right in the callback. So instead of having the selected name and then the use effect. What we should do instead is create a callback called like on select name. And this is going to be a name. And then we'll just go and fetch that name. Now we can get rid of all this use effect stuff. And over here, we will just call that on selected name change with the name and let's see how it works. Perfect. And very reliable and no potential problem with use effect. And this is something I see a lot where folks use a combination of state and a use effect when in reality, they're just responding to some user interaction and they should just go and do the action right at that point. It's the simplest thing to do, and it's the right thing to do in this case. So 
you really want to, as cool as use effect is, limit the amount that you use it to just the things where you need it. Like for example, this use effect up here. Okay, so let's talk about when use effect gets a little bit hairy. And that's when use effect depends on data that it also writes. So to experiment with that, let's create a stopwatch component. And what this stopwatch is gonna do is it's gonna have a, an incrementing time. So it starts off at zero and it just every second goes up by one. So we'll return a div that has time with the timer on it. So far so good. So let's bring that down in here and we'll use it. There we go. Time is zero. Cool. So what do we need to do to get this going? Well, we need to use a set interval. So now we know that if we were to put a set interval right here and just set the time to the time plus one and then do a thousand, that just like that fetch that we had before, you're gonna run into an infinite loop because every second we're gonna set that time, that setting of the time is going to force a re-render of the entire stopwatch function, which is going to get the new time. Yay, it's gonna be one. And then it's gonna run another set interval which is going to create lots and lots and lots and lots of intervals. So we don't want to do that. Well, we want to go and create one interval. So let's go and use use effect for that. And we know from before that we want to create an empty dependency right here because we only want this interval to get created once. So let's try this out. Let's see if this works. So I'm going to hit save. And now we go from zero and we go to one. We just stick there. So what's the deal? Let's put in console log and see what's up. So we'll do console.log and we'll just put in time. Well, what, what, what's time? Because that should be going up and up and up, right? That number. So let's hit save. So go zero to one. But if we look back at our code, we can see in the console, which is out here with console ninja, we're just getting a time at zero over and over and over again. So what's happening? Well, what's happening is that we first initialized this effect when we got our initial component render. And at that time, time, the value was zero. And what JavaScript did was we created a closure here and we captured time at zero. And so now inside of this function, time is forever going to be locked at zero. So what's one option? Well, we could go and add time in there as a dependency so that when time changes, we rerun this and we get a new value for time. But that's gonna run into the same infinite loop problem because we're gonna go and create interval after interval after interval after interval. Another option is that there's a secondary way to call a setter on use state. One way is to just give it the new value. Another way is to give it a function. And that function takes the previous value and then you get to return whatever the new value is. So in this case, that would be time plus one. So let's hit save. And now we have a working timer. And if we were to go into here and put in a console log, we would see that this number for time the actual current value goes up and up and up. And in fact, I can make it a little bit easier to understand by just putting in like, for example, like T to distinguish it from time because time is, is captured within this function, but T is just the current value for time. And there's one more thing to know about use effect. And that's that the function that you give use effect can return a cleanup function. And that cleanup function we get called whenever the old use effect is getting kind of unmounted or gotten rid of, and the new use effect is coming in. So in this case, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to clear that interval that we created. So I'm going to capture that interval ID, and then I'm going to return a cleanup function where I clear that interval. And that makes this a solid 
timer interval. I ask actually this question a lot when it comes to interviews. And if you were to give me this code, probably minus that console log, I'd definitely give you a passing grade on your interview. So of course, there's a lot to understand and know about use effect, but use effect is really important as you build your own custom hooks, or if you just want to use React's native state management as the state management foundation of your application, use effect is the kind of thing that you're going to really need to become familiar with and make sure that you are very comfortable with it. Yes, you can get yourself into some serious hot water with use effect, but in all honesty, it is an understandable thing. And when you understand the fundamentals of JavaScript and how they work with use effect, it actually is a lot less spooky. So just spend a lot of quality time with it. And I swear you will get a lot better at it. Now I mentioned early on that there was this other way of storing state in a component called useRef. So we'll take a look at that next. Okay. Let's take a quick look at useRef. It is one more way to associate state with a component in React. The interesting thing about useRef though, is that when you change the value of a reference, it doesn't actually cause a component re-render. So that can be convenient in some cases, but there's actually two ways that folks use useRef. So let me show you the first way, the most common way, and then I'll show you about the state management side of it after that. This is the native useRef folder in our GitHub repository of applications. If you're looking over there, so I'm going to bring in use ref. And the first thing I'm going to use it for is I think the most common use case, which is to get a reference to an HTML element. So in this case, we'll create an input element and then get a reference to that. So we have this text element and now we want to set focus on that input when it first starts up. So I'm going to create a ref, a reference to that element by using use ref and then just starting off with the initial value of null. And then I will use ref equals and then just give it that ref. Now let's see if this works. Okay. It looks good. We can go and add stuff in there. But what we want is we want that input to be initially given the focus. So they get the little blinking cursor in there when it starts up. So how do we do that? Well, we need to one, know that the reference is defined as something that means that the component will have rendered, and then we will have gotten a reference to that element. And the way that we know that is if we use a use effect because use effect runs after all that happens. So let's bring in use effect. And we want this to only happen once. So what do we do? we give it an empty dependency array. And then within that dependency array, we just focus on the current. So what is current? Well, when you have a reference, you have a current value associated with that reference. You don't just do input ref dot focus because input ref is itself just a pointer to current and current is the thing that you can set or read from. So let's hit save, see how we do. And now anytime that the page refreshes, we automatically set focus to that element. So super easy, nice. That is the way that you get access to elements in React. And that's the primary use of use ref. But there's another use, and that is to maintain state without doing any updates. Let's build out an example here. So we're going to have a list of names and we're going to use this input fields to go and add a new name to our list of names. So let's get that all set up. So we have our use date with our empty array of names to start. Let's go and put that into a div. Cool. So now we need a button that we can use to say, Hey, add this name that we just typed into this list. So let's create an on add name. And we'll assign that to the on click. Now, remember from before, when I talked about use callback, we're not using a use callback here because I'm just passing this on add name function to this HTML element. It's not its own react component. So I know exactly what's going to happen with that on click. It's not going to create any kind of referential identity problems like we would have with passing that on add name to a nested react component that may do, I don't know what with that on add name. 
now what we need to do is we need to go and set names to the current names plus the value of this component, which is pretty cool, right? Because we already have a link to this input. Oh, we, we can just reach out and grab it. So we can say, okay, cool, get the value from that component. This is called an uncontrolled input in React. And it's actually the most efficient way to manage an input. You don't have to use that set and get value. And then one last thing we can do is we can just set that value to an empty string. Cool, so let's give this a try. Oh, looks like it's blowing up, let's see why. So I go my enemy inspector, console, uh, we didn't bring in use state. Huh, makes sense. Okay, so let's go back over here. Use state. Cool. And there we go. All right. So Jack, add name. Hey, wow. So what about use ref in this world? Well, let's say instead of having just the names, each one of these had like ID one is John and ID two is Jane. So you have an ID and a name. So it's not just a name, it's it's a structure. And let's go make names sing that tune. So this is going to be name and then name dot name. <laughs> not exactly great, fine. Okay, looks good. So now there we go. But now when I do add name, foo, this is gonna blow up because add name, I'm just adding the single value, right? I'm just adding a string. So what we really need to do is have an ID with something, yeah, let's put that to 10 right now, and then a name. There we go. So we want to track this ID and we want a an incrementing ID, auto incrementing ID. So that's where something like useRef is gonna come in handy. We don't necessarily wanna use useState for that ID because we don't really care that the UI gets updated when we change that value. So we can just manage the ID using a ref. So let's create that ID ref by using use ref and then starting it at one. And now down here, we can just use ID ref current and we can just treat it like a value like current plus plus. Let's take a look. Current plus plus. Nice. And then down here, current plus plus. Awesome. And just to check, let's go and add in the name.id down here. All right, so there we go. We got one is John, two is Jane, just like we set up right here with the one and the two. And then we have Jack. Let's see what I get. I get three. How cool is that? So you can set this value current without forcing a refresh of the React tree, which is great. Of course, it doesn't really matter in this case, since in all honesty, by just on add name does a set name, which in turn actually still re-renders a component. But I think in some cases it's valuable to hold state in a use ref like this. And it's just good to know that that's there if you need it. Next up, we're gonna start finishing up our look at native React state management by getting into context and also creating your own custom state management hooks exciting stuff and it's going to culminate in us building our own Pokemon search application. Seems like it's time to start wrapping up React Native state management before we get into indirect state management like React Query and into state managers like Redux and Jotai and all those. But before we do that, we need to talk about context and we also need to talk about custom hooks because those are the ways to kind of package and redistribute state in a native React state management model. We also need to talk about TypeScript. So you might've noticed that I haven't been using TypeScript up until, well, now. And the reason is because I want us to focus on the model of state management and learning about the reactive nature of state in the native React state model. Declaring state using use state and use reducer and then monitoring state using use callback, use memo, and use effect. But now it's time to talk about TypeScript because in reality, you're probably gonna wanna use TypeScript when you're using almost any state management system, including React Native State Management. So from here on out, we will be doing TypeScript. 
So now the native context app that you're looking at right here is basically the same thing we've been looking at so far, except that I use the react dash TS template invite to build it. So it's the TypeScript version. And I've also added tailwind and a Pokemon JSON file that has a list of Pokemon in it, including Bulbasaur, which apparently is a grass and poison Pokemon, it has all these stats. And we'll be using this data source going forward as we take a look at how to actually put all of what we learned into practice. So that starts with learning about custom hooks. So let's go and build ourselves a custom hook to go and get that Pokemon data. So what are the things we know we're gonna need? Well, we know we're gonna need state. We're gonna have to hold it. So let's bring in use state. And we also know that custom hooks start with the word use. And so I guess I'll just say use Pokemon as the name of this custom hook. And custom hooks are implemented as functions. So let's create our use Pokemon function. Now I don't think it needs to take any arguments. We we'll just have use Pokemon. And it will have a list of Pokemon that it will then return. So now we have our state. We'll initialize it to null. In fact, actually, let's be nice. Let's initialize it to an empty array. And the next thing we need to do in our use Pokemon hook is to use an effect to go and do that fetch. So let's try that out. So use effect takes a function. It also takes a dependency array. We only want to load the Pokemon once. So which dependency array do we use? We use an empty dependency array. So now let's do our fetch and we'll get our local Pokemon JSON file, which we'll then convert the response on and take the data. And then we'll set the Pokemon with that data. But of course we don't have set Pokemon. So let's go add that. And now we'll just give it the data. So now we have a problem that we don't actually see yet, which is that the type of Pokemon isn't what we expect. The type of Pokemon is a never array. So what does that even mean? Well, it means that TypeScript can't infer what this array is going to be. So it defaults to saying, well, never. You can have an empty array. It has to be empty for its whole life. That's the only thing that I can guarantee about it. So we need to define what a Pokemon looks like and then tell useState that it's going to be an array of that. So how do we do that? Well, we define an interface for Pokemon. So we look over here at Pokemon JSON, we got ID, name, type, which is an array of strings, and that all corresponds to this interface, ID, name, type, which is an array of strings, and then all of the parameters for that Pokemon. And now with this interface, we can then tell useState that this is going to be a Pokemon array. And the way that we do that is we use the generic syntax, and then we put in a Pokemon array. And now if I look over here at Pokemon, Command-K, Command-I, we are getting back a Pokemon array. But if you're like, I uh, shouldn't have been able to infer the type of the Pokemon from Pokemon JSON. I mean, yeah, it's sitting right there. Well, no, because we get Pokemon JSON at runtime. So it has really no idea what the structure of that is until we tell it what the structure of that is. So this is your first lesson in native React hook typing. Honestly, it doesn't get a whole lot more complex than this. You notice that there's no typing on use effect. There is no typing on this use Pokemon hook. We could add return typing if we wanted to by just saying we're going to have a list of Pokemon, which is going to be either an array of Pokemon or null, but honestly, R is going to have an array of Pokemon. And, but that's it. So you really don't have to use TypeScript a lot when it comes to React state management. Okay, so let's see what we're getting back. Let's do use Pokemon down here and we'll get our Pokemon. And the easiest way to do this and just find out is this a JSON stringify it. And let's see what we get. And we get a whole bunch of data. Nice. Love it. So now we've got our data source. Let's say that we want to go and make a Pokemon list that shows Pokemon. So it's going to take 
Pokemon as a prop. And that Pokemon prop is going to be an array of Pokemon. And you know what? Let's do it a little bit nicer of our formatting on this. We'll create a div. We'll map through our Pokemon. We'll create a div for each one. And let's try this out. So we're going to do Pokemon list and then give it our Pokemon. There we go. A nice list of Pokemon. A long list of Pokemon. What if we don't want to have to prop drill everything? Because here we're doing what's called prop drilling. We're taking data and we are sending it down as props. Maybe this Pokemon list is deep inside of our hierarchy of React components. And we don't want to have to go and drill that Pokemon property all the way down. And maybe we have a bunch of different components that use Pokemon and we just don't want to have to shuttle that data all around. Is there an easier way to do that? And the answer is yes. And it's context. That's what we need to do. We need to provide this Pokemon data down to anyone who wants to use it. And the way that we do that is we route it through context. So we need to create some context. So the first thing we need to use out of React is create context. And you know what? I'm just going to start off looking at context just by creating like very simple context. We'll just say like a theme provider or something like that. So we're going to create a theme context. Okay, so now how do we use this theme context? Well, we need to wrap components that consume the context with a context provider. The way that we do that is we instantiate a theme context dot provider. So automatically when you do create context, you get back a dot provider and it's a react element that you can use to provide the value down and you specify the value by just specifying the prop for the value. So in this case, we're going to say dark is, is the value, the current value. It starts off defaulting to light. So now how do we consume this? Let's just give it a try. Let's go over into Pokemon list and try and see if we can consume theme context. So I can show you how it routes around. So we'll bring in the use context hook, which is how you access context. And in this case, we're just going to get the theme by using that use context hook and pointing it at that theme context. So let's see what the theme is. And the theme is dark. Nice. If I go over here and I change that value to light, now the theme is light. And we can see that we don't actually have to prop drill down the theme. We just have that theme context and wherever we want to use that theme, we just use context. We give it the context and we get the value back. Okay. So obviously we don't want to do theming or maybe we do, you can do that for yourself if you like. What we want to do is use this Pokemon data. So we want to provide this Pokemon data down to the rest of the application through this context. So I'm going to call this Pokemon context. And hmm. Okay, so what are we going to put in there as a starting state? What we could do is we could say that we have just a an array of Pokemon because that's the output of what this of this use Pokemon here. And let's see, does that work? So Pokemon context. Let's go down here to theme context, change it to Pokemon context. Let's give it a value. So that value is going to be the output of use Pokemon. Looking pretty good. Now we don't have Pokemon there, so we can actually get rid of it. And now we can pick up Pokemon from the Pokemon context. And so I'll rename this Pokemon CTX. And if I look at that, then the context is an object where we have Pokemon. But it's a little easier just to do Pokemon. And there we go. Well, we don't have a theme. Let's, let's get rid of that. All right. Looks good. Nice. So now using context, we can see that we can move around all that data without doing any prop drilling. But there's a few things that I don't like. One, I don't like to use context directly. So I want to make a hook that gets us access to that context data that's named appropriately. And unfortunately, Use Pokemon is kind of camping on that name. 
because use Pokemon would be a really good name for that hook. So what am I going to use instead of use Pokemon? Well, we could do something like use Pokemon source. That kind of works. Let's do that. So down here, this is going to be the source hook that has the data in it. And then we can do something like define use Pokemon by just returning the use context from the Pokemon context. And now down here, we can just use Pokemon. All right, it's starting to look a little cleaner. I like that. And now there's one more fix up I think we should do around this context sharing mechanism before we get into actually kind of fleshing out this app and using all of the other hooks that we've seen. So the first thing we need to do is get the typing right on create context. So the way that we do that is we use that generic syntax. And what are we going to have in our context? Well, we're going to have the return type of the use Pokemon source function. So this is use Pokemon source. We're going to have the return type of that. And it's either going to be that or undefined. So now we can just set this to undefined. But now the problem is that the output of use Pokemon is either all of the cool stuff that we got from use Pokemon source or undefined. And so down here, as we use it, it's like, ah, uh, you could be undefined, dude. And you're not handling that. But we know that it's always going to be valid. We know that we're always going to have a value. So one thing we could do is we could just use an exclamation point that basically tells TypeScript, hey, it's always going to be not undefined. But another thing that I've seen people do, and I'm kind of torn on whether exactly this is the right idea, but I think it's fine, is to instead of allowing for undefined, so we just go back to something like this, we just take an empty object and we can take that empty object and tell and lie basically to TypeScript and tell it that it is a return type from that use Pokemon source. So the way that we do that is we say as unknown and then as the return type of use Pokemon source, you kind of have to go through this two step with TypeScript. You know, honestly, once you get this set up, you won't really see most of this typing and you'd just be using it and it'll be fine. So little hacks like this aren't necessarily that tough. You're only going to have these in a few places in your code base. All right, well, I think we've got a pretty good start here. We have our Pokemon data. We've got Tailwind. We have a bunch of knowledge about these other hooks that we can use so that we can make an application that gives us a searchable Pokemon index that even looks pretty cool. All right, we'll do that next. All right, we're starting off at exactly the same point. I've just taken the native context directory and cloned it to native Pokemon. So if you're following along on the GitHub, this is the native Pokemon app. And what we have is we have a list of the Pokemon. Cool. So the first thing I want to do is kind of refactor this a little bit. It's getting a little messy. So I'm going to go and take all of the stuff that's related to the data, the store, and I'm going to pull that out and put it in its own file. We'll call that store.tsx. Pop that all down in there. All right, so what do we need out of here? Well, we need most of it, actually. We need to use Pokemon source. And we need Pokemon context and we need use Pokemon. Cool. So now let's go back over here and get rid of all of that. And then import it from that store. Not too shabby. Let's hit save, try refresh. Refreshing. I love it. But there's one thing I, I'm not quite sold on. I don't like that the app is having to maintain this connection between use Pokemon source and Pokemon context provider. And I think we can kind of hide that elegantly by making a Pokemon provider component. I think it's actually pretty easy. So let's go over here to our store and then we will export a new component called Pokemon provider, which will take children where those children are a React node type. And we'll put our children in there. And now we can get rid of the export of the Pokemon context, as well as the export of the use Pokemon source. Nobody else needs to know about them but us. So let's bring in Pokemon provider over in app.tsx. And 
Here we go. Nice. Again, let's try it out. Very good. Cool. So let's make this a bit swanky, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to wrap the whole app in a centering tag. In Tailwind, that means setting the max width of the screen and then auto the X axis. So MX auto kind of bring it in from the sides. So let's take a look at that. Oh, nice. Very cool. So now it's kind of in a little bit. So now we're going to model Pokemon in an HTML sense as a list item. So in order to bracket that, you have to have a UL or an unordered list. And so for our tailwind, we're going to say that this is a grid. And let's take a look, see how that goes. Huh? Pretty good. Nice. And then I'm going to bring in a bunch of HTML, which is going to format our Pokemon. And of course, all of this code is available to you in GitHub for free. I'm not going to type it all in because it's just a whole bunch of tailwind, but I do need to go and add a key and let's take a look. Wow. That's pretty cool. So the next thing we want to do is have a search box. So I'm going to create a search box up here and we're going to provide for searching. So let's go and create a component for this called search box. And we will return an input tag in there. Give it some nice tailwinding and let's take a look. Ah, whoa, that's good looking already. Nice. So now we need a place to store that data, right? We need to hold the search term. So let's go over here and take a look at our use Pokemon source. Cause I think that's a good spot for it. Now we could just add another item in here for search. And in fact, actually, you don't even need to specify a string there. Just that will do. But I do want to show how to type use reducer. So let's use a reducer for this. And let's see how we go. So we're going to use use reducer. And the initial type is going to have an array of Pokemon and a search term. Fair enough. Now we need to bring in user reducer. Cool. Okay. And we need a reducer, right? And that's going to take two things. It's going to take the current state and it's going to take an action. And we're going to have that big switch statement in there, but currently it's complaining about our lack of typing. So let's go and add some typing here. So let's, let's first type state. We're going to call this the Pokemon state. So what is that? Well, that is going to be an array of Pokemon and then the search string. Fair enough. That's pretty easy. And then the action, let's, let's put together some actions. So the first one I'm going to have is like the set of the Pokemon itself. So let's call those Pokemon actions. And it's going to have a type where we say set Pokemon and the payload is going to be an array of Pokemon. So now we just need to start implementing on this. So we need to switch on that action and set that Pokemon. So we're going to return the existing state with the new payload and that's it. Yeah, pretty good. So that's how you type a use reducer. So now the output of that is going to be the data and the dispatch. So let's get that out of there. So the first parameter is going to be that object. And from that parameter, we're going to grab the Pokemon and the search. And then we're going to grab that dispatch. Okay. Looking good so far, but now down here, we have that set Pokemon. So we need to replace that with that dispatch. And what is the type on that? Well, set Pokemon and was the payload the data. So now coming out of this function, we're also going to return the search string and we just return it. And if I look at use Pokemon and say, what are you getting out of there? It's getting the array of Pokemon and that search string. So let's go use that. So we'll go over here to our search box. We will grab our use Pokemon and instead of Pokemon, we'll just grab search and set that as the value. So to see this all wired up, let's do something fun. Let's call this set the initial state to something like foo. 
Yeah, perfect. So now we need to have a way of setting that search. So let's add another option for our Pokemon action. And we'll call this one set search and give it a string as the payload. Now we need to switch on that type and return an updated state that has the new search in it. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But we need a way to actually dispatch that. And we're not exposing dispatch. So what do we do? Well, we need a set search function and we need to return that. So this set search function is going to take a search string and return nothing, a void. So how do we define that? Well, we can come down here. We can say that set search is takes a search string and dispatches a type of set search with a payload of that search. Cool. And then we return it. But I did say something early on about use callback and custom hooks. You should always use use callback in custom hooks when you're defining a function that you're returning. So let's do that. Let's uh, bring in our use callback. And then down here with set search, I'm going to call use callback. And what do we use for the dependency array? Well, we use an empty dependency array because there are no dependencies. Like there's nothing going on in here except for the dispatch, which is a constant and then search, which is we get in as a parameter. So there's nothing we need to depend on. Okay. So let's go take a look over in our app and we will do set search on that value. And then we need to bring in set search. Cool. So that probably works. I'm hoping we'll work on the idea that that worked. So let's get rid of this while we're here and we'll go back up to our store. So now we need to have like a searched set of Pokemon. So we have our Pokemon, we have our search term. We need to calculate the array that falls within that search. So when we think about using a calculated value, what do we use? We use memo. So let's go bring in our friend use memo. And so we'll create a new array of the filtered Pokemon using that memo. And we'll return a filter where we take any Pokemon with a name includes that search. So what is the dependency array going to look like in this case? Well, let's have a think about that for a second. So what are we reading from here? Well, we're reading from Pokemon. So that's clearly got to go in there. And we're also reading from search because we're including search there. So let's give that a go. Now, what do we do with filter Pokemon? Well, what we can do is we can just say, well, the Pokemon, the return isn't the original whole list of Pokemon. It's just the filter Pokemon by just saying filter Pokemon. So now let's try and filter this down to B U L B and we have just the Bulbasaur. <laughs> How cool is that? See, that's the reactive nature of react state management. You're creating this connection between the original data source Pokemon and that search term. And then when either of those things changes, this use memo triggers, and then we get an updated filter Pokemon. So once you get those relationships set up right, it actually is a very elegant system. Okay, so let's just take the top 20 here because this gets a little crazy. I mean, we've got 800 of these things. So let's just slice off the top 20. I'll make it a little bit more efficient. All right, so another feature thing, I want to make this case insensitive. So the way we do that is we would lowercase everything and compare that. Cool. And now if I go over here and I type in B U L B lowercase or whatever case it finds bubble source. So case insensitive. That's nice. And then I guess the last thing I want to do is I want to sort the Pokemon on the way out. And I think it, that's another good use for use memo. So let's go and create a sorted version of the filtered Pokemon.
So we're going to take that filter Pokemon and we'll just sort it on the name. So we'll do a dot name and then locale compare that to B dot name. And so what do we need to depend on? Well, the only thing we're reading from here is filtered Pokemon. So let's add filtered Pokemon. And now we've got sorted Pokemon. I put that in there for the output Pokemon and cool. Now we have a sorted list. So let's see, uh, you will be or you will. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So B G S T sorted. All right, so this is really cool. We've learned all about React's native state management system. We've used a lot of it in this particular example. I certainly recommend if you want to, to stop the video at this point, work through this example, get comfortable with it because this set of hooks, use state, use reducer, use callback, use memo, use effect, that is the underpinnings of state management in React in 2022. Everything else kind of fits on top of that. So if you're using indirect state management, like React Query, React Hook Form, or React Location, those work in conjunction with these hooks. If you're using something like Redux, or Jotai, or Recoil, or Zustand, you're going to use a combination of that and also the native hooks built in. So it's really important to get a foundation set where you really feel comfortable with all of those hooks. And in particular, obviously use effect, which trips a lot of folks up. So now we're going to get into indirect state management by taking a look at one of my favorite libraries, react query. So now that we understand the foundation of native react state management, it's time to take a look at third party libraries and see how they can help us make our lives easier. And we're going to take a look at two. We're going to take a look at react query and react location. Let's go take a look over at their websites. So here's our current site, obviously, and our 10 stack query site. Now react location and react query are both part of Tanner Lindsley's tan stack. It's really cool. So what react query is primarily designed to do is allow you to easily query data from a server as well as post data to a server to mutate it. It can be used actually for, to manage any promise. So it's, it's, it's a generally awesome library. There's another one called SWR from Versal that's also really good. I think React Query is currently like 12K, SWR is 4K. So you can decide for yourself which one you want to use. They're fairly similar. React Location is the tan stack version of React Router. We're going to use that because we're going to turn our single page app into a multi-page app. So let's start off with React Query and make it a little easier on ourselves to query the Pokemon. So let's go over here and take a look at the inspector and look at the network. And we can see that when we refresh, we're actually getting Pokemon.json twice. And this freaks a lot of folks out, but it really just is a, a matter of being in development mode with strict mode on. So why does this happen? Well, if I look over here in main, we can see that React strict mode is on. And in React 18 strict mode, what happens is React automatically, when it first gets your component, it mounts it, and then it unmounts it, and it remounts it. And the idea is to help you look for any leaks that you might have, particularly in use effects that you don't close out properly. But the net result is that things like use effect, which we use down here, if they have, well, any dependency array, honestly, but people believe that the empty dependency array says that this is only going to happen on load or on mount. And what happens is use effect gets run twice because you mount, unmount, and then remount. So actually the contract is true. Use effect with an empty dependency array only ever gets run once on a mount, but it just happens that React 18 in strict mode with development mode on actually mounts you twice. So yeah. That's why you get two calls, but Hey, it's fine. Let's go and replace basically all of this fetch code with react query. So how are we going to do that? We're going to start by bringing in the react query library. We'll get started. Let's see. We need to install. So we're going to yarn add tan stack react query. And then I'll bring up the site again. So now what we need to do is we need to, on the app side, 
build a query client provider as well as a query client. Now that query client is basically a cache. So that's actually going to help us with this double problem because when we ask React Query to go and get that Pokemon JSON for us, the first time it's going to go and get it. And then the second time it's going to say, hey, I've already got this in the cache. You don't need to worry about that. And it's going to handle that for us. So how do we get that process started? Well, we got to bring in the query client provider as well as a query client creator from Tanstack. And then we'll create our query client and then we'll wrap our whole app in a query client provider. This is again, like a context thing, like we learned earlier. This is just a context-based provider that is managed by that Tanstack React query. So let's give this a try, see if it works. Hit refresh and everything is still refreshing. Cool. So let's go over to our store.tsx and see how we can use this. Well, we can use this by bringing in use query from Tanstack. And now down in here, we're going to make some changes. So I'm going to get rid of this as well as the Pokemon, because we're not going to manage the Pokemon ourselves anymore. We're going to use Tanstack for that. So we're going to get rid of anything that would be setting the Pokemon and initializing it. Cool. Awesome. And we'll get rid of our use effect. And we don't need to set Pokemon. All right. Looks good. So now we can use use query. So what, what does use query do? So now we can use use query. So let's bring in use query and it takes a bunch of parameters. The first one is a query identifier. So we'll put in an array, which says that this is going to be the Pokemon array. So that uniquely identifies this particular query for caching purposes. Then you need to give it a fetcher. So we're going to give it fetch Pokemon.json, and then we're going to get the JSON from that request. So we have to provide it with the fetcher. It actually doesn't do that for us, which is kind of an interesting thing. But again, use query is more of a, a promise watcher. It doesn't really care what promises you throw at it. So in this case, we're throwing a fetch at it, which is the query that is in the title of the hook. Okay. And then the last thing we need to do is give it what the initial data is. So when it's not got the request done, what do you actually want to put in there in the meantime? And we'll just put an empty array in there. Okay. That's cool. So let's go and get the data out of this. So we'll get an object from it. That object contains data and we can just rename that to Pokemon. But this is actually typed as any currently. So let's cast that to a Pokemon array. And now we have an array of Pokemon. Let's give it a try and see where we go. Refresh. Nice. It's that easy. Literally. How cool is that? So we don't have to have that use state or use reducer that holds that data. We don't have to have the use effect that go gets that data. We can just use react query, and then let it manage the data. And that's what I mean by an indirect state manager is react queries. Primary job is to manage that promise. But in doing that, it also has to get the data from that promise, which it retains and it stores for us. So it manages part of our data. So let's go see if it's actually solved our double network call problem. Let's go over to network. And yeah, now we're only getting that Pokemon JSON just the once even in react 18 in development mode. All right. So now it's time to turn our awesome single page app into a multi-page app using react location. And in doing this, we're going to see that the URL is going to contain part of the data, because what I want to do here is I want to be able to click on one of these and get detail about Beedrill or Blastoise or whatever it is. And that's going to go to a slash Pokemon slash ID. And that ID is going to be part of our data, right? It is part of our data model for the application. So let's go and see how we do react location. So we'll go over to installation and we see that all we need to do is bring in react location, stop the server, paste that line in, start the server again. And so what do we need to do? Well, we need to bring in a few things from our react location. We need to bring in a 
link. That's what we're going to use to do the client side links. We're going to use outlet, which is a way where you can specify where the content of the route is supposed to go, which is effectively like the query client. So we're going to create one of those just like that. We're going to use the router, which is a component that wraps the application, gives us that context. And then we're also going to use use match as a way we can get the parameter from the route. So the next thing we need to do is give ourselves a list of routes. Now our routes are listed as an array. Each array has a path and then an element that you want to render when you go to that particular path. There's actually a whole bunch of stuff around this. There's loaders and everything else. There's children elements. It's a, it's a really a much more robust system than what I'm showing off here. I just want to kind of show off sort of the basics. So in this case, our current route is slash. And what we want to show in there is our search box and our Pokemon list. So what are we going to do with this? Well, we're going to go and wrap our div in that router, give it that location as well as the routes that we just created. And we'll finish off the router. And now we can take this content section and replace that with the outlet. So whatever the route is, that content is going to go in here in our nice MX auto kind of put it all together. If you had like a header, we go above that. If you had like a footer and go below it, all that kind of stuff. All right, let's uh, go over here, hit refresh and there you go. So we can try this out, see if that's actually the case or not. Just say, you know, div main route refresh. Cool. We are on the main route and apparently we're talking in French. That's kind of cool. All right. Uh, okay. Let's get rid of the main route there. And now we want our detail route. So we want a Pokemon detail component detail, right? And where we want to put that, we want to put that on a path like Pokemon and then ID. And the colon ID means that anything in the slot here is going to be assigned to a parameter called ID. And there's a bunch of different things you can put on that, but that's a pretty standard way to define routes. And we'll just point that at the Pokemon detail. All right. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to make each one of these Pokemon clickable and they're currently not. So let's go back over here and we'll use that link. Give it the key say that we're going to the Pokemon at that PID. Get rid of this key and then finish off the link. And there we go. So let's see. Okay. Hey, now we've got a little finger. Let's click on that. And we have our detail page again in French, but not really. Okay, cool. Nice. So how do we get the ID from this. Well, we use that use match to get the ID from the parameter that is ID right here. So we bring in use match, we get the ID, and then we need to get our list of Pokemon. And then within that, we need to find the Pokemon that corresponds to that ID. So we do a find, and then we do that parse of the int. I'm just going to use plus ID there because I like that a little bit better. And then if we don't have any Pokemon data, we can just say, you know, no Pokemon found or whatever, because we already have the data, but if we do have the data, let's stringify that and let's see what we get. Click on B drill and nice. Now we get our data. Now all we need to do is just format it. So I'm going to actually bring in a fairly big block to format this and give us something that you can play with and have some fun with. All right. So I'm going to replace this div with this code and we'll walk through it. So up at the top, we're going to have a container div. It's going to give us a little margin. Then we're going to have a, a home link that's going to link back to slash. So we have a way to get back. Then we're going to have a two column grid. That's going to have the image of the Pokemon. And then over in the other one, we'll have a bold name. So we have the Pokemon data here, change that out. All right. And then we'll have our stats and then we go through each one of the stats. So hit points, attack, defense, special attack, special defense, all that stuff. And with that, we create a two column grid where we have the stat name and then we have the Pokemon data. So here's a little fun little piece of 
TypeScript in here. Stat is just going to be a string, HP, so on and so forth. Now, Pokemon data is a typed object. So it doesn't know that stat is going to be a key from that type, but we can basically tell it that the, it is going to be that by saying that this stat is going to be a key of the type of Pokemon data. So we're going to get the type from Pokemon data, which is a Pokemon. And then we're going to get a key from that type and all the keys in that type are HP attack and so on and so forth. And so that's why we don't get any issues with TypeScript right there. Oh, nice. A cool looking B drill and all of the information about it. All right. So really, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about as an indirect state manager that in this case, this react location library is holding the ID of our Pokemon, which is essential data to the function of the page. And so this ID in conjunction with all of the work that we've done in use Pokemon gives us an ability to run that detail page and show the Pokemon that the person's interested in. So it's a combination of our native state management that we've already built, as well as smartly leveraging third party libraries like react router in addition to react location. And if you're doing a lot of forms management, I might recommend that you might look at something like react hook form or formic or final form, because all of those will manage the fields for you. So if you have a big form that has lots of different fields with lots of different validations, you don't need to manage all the state of the actual form fields themselves. You can let that third party library do that for you. And I use React Hook form and swear by it. So go check that out. So if you look at the GitHub repo that's associated with this video that's linked to in the description down below, you'll find a direct Pokemon starter folder. And this direct Pokemon starter is what we're going to use as we experiment with these different state managers. So what is this? Well, this is a simple starter that we have for this particular application. Like we have the search box, we get the Pokemon list and all of it is basically sort of unimplemented. It is waiting for us to implement on the store. And the first direct state manager that we are going to play with is one called Sushdan. It's very popular and is a unidirectional data manager. So I'm going to go and clone this direct Pokemon starter and create one called direct Pokemon Sushdan and get started with it. All right. So I'm going to go and copy recursively that direct Pokemon starter to direct Pokemon Sushdand and then bring it up in VS Code. All right, now the first thing I need to do is install Sushdand. And I just gotta, I gotta show you the homepage for Sushdand. It's just amazing. So this is the Sushdand homepage. It shows you a little bit about how to use Sushdand. And I just love it because look, it's, it's a bear. It's cool. I, I just love this page. So, well, whatever anyway. So, okay. So there's our, our Zustand page and we can see from it how we create a Zustand store. We use create and that's going to give us back our own custom hook. That's going to manage that store for us. And we can use a setter to set it from a method. So let's try it out. Let's uh, go back over here to our source and into store and we'll bring in that create. And now we're going to create use Pokemon. So what do we want in our Pokemon store? Well, we want the Pokemon list. We probably want a list of all the Pokemon in the store because the Pokemon is going to be like the filtered and sorted version of it. We want a full list of Pokemon. So we'll call that all Pokemon. We'll have a way to set the Pokemon. So that'll be a setter and you give it the Pokemon. And then we also need a search string we'll Call that search. And a way to set that search. Okay. Now let's start this up. So we'll create a Pokemon array, which is just empty. The all Pokemon array is empty and we'll set the all Pokemon function to take a Pokemon array and then set that all Pokemon to that array. And we'll set search to an empty string and then we'll have a setter for search. So I'm also going to go and set Pokemon here because we're not going to implement the searching filter right away, but I do want to have that Pokemon data available. All right. So let's go over to our app and bring it in. So let's bring in use Pokemon. And then up here, we're going to get search and set search from use Pokemon. 
Now this is one way to do it. Another way to do it is to use what's called a selector. So here's, here's how a selector works. So let's say, say we want to get search in particular. So we use use Pokemon and that will get given a function, which gets given the state and we peel off from that, the search. And I think that's actually the best way to go because what a selector allows you to do is say, Hey, I only want this part of the store. So only when that store part updates, do I actually want to get updated? And that's a way to kind of select down from the store. So if you have large stores that are being looked at by a bunch of different components, but the components update on different things, they should all use selectors. And I think it's just best practice to really start off by using selectors. So we also got to get set search. And now we can implement on this. So search is going to go in the value. And this is going to call set search with the event target value. Got to bring in the event and cool. All right. And then down here in the Pokemon list, we will have our Pokemon and we will run it. Okay, nice. Let's give it a try. Yarn dev to bring up the server and see where we go. So nothing. So why nothing? Well, we haven't actually gone and gotten the data yet, but at least it's not blowing up. So that's a good thing. All right. So let's, uh, let's go and fetch the data. Pokemon.json. And then get the JSON from that. And then we're going to call that set all Pokemon method on that hook. Seems weird, right? But it actually works. So the first thing we need to do is reference the hook. So use Pokemon. And then we got to get the state from that. That state includes set all Pokemon, and we can use that to set that Pokemon. So let's try it out. All right, cool. So what this is showing us is that you have this externalized state manager in this Tushdan hook, use Pokemon, but you can talk to it outside of a React component context, which is one of the things that we look for in direct state managers. Direct state managers should be able to be accessed by unit tests or by code that's external to the React tree or code that's internal to the React tree. And that's the the sign of a good direct state manager. And Sushdand is a very good direct state manager. Okay, so I think we're doing good. The only problem is that we don't actually search on anything. So we click that and nothing. So let's go make it happen. So, so let's go make ourselves a filter and sort function that takes a list of Pokemon, all Pokemon, and a search, and then gives us back the list of Pokemon that matches that search, also sorted. So we'll call that search and sort. Pokemon, it'll take a list of the Pokemon, it'll take a search string, and then it will filter through that and then sort them by name. But also we only want to get the top 10, so let's just slice that off. And there we go. Okay, cool. So now we have our search and sort. Let's go down here to our set all Pokemon. And for Pokemon, we can call that set and search. We have Pokemon, but we also have our search. So where's our search coming from? Well, our search, we got to go get that. So we're going to bring in the get parameter and then we'll call get and that'll give us the search, the current search. So we're going to do the same thing down here in search. So we're going to set Pokemon to be the search and sort of Pokemon. But in this case, we don't have the Pokemon, so we need to go get that. But we do have the search. And let's see how we go. Perfect. Love it. And so fast. And you see why people really love Tsushtan. It is a very concise, very easy way to make a new custom hook that manages data for you externally to the React tree so you can make it global, but it also integrates really well 
with your React app and also with any other hooks. You could use things like use memo or use state or use reducer in conjunction with this. So you could have Sushdan manage the global data and then any local data managed with basic React hooks. So awesome stuff. So I've talked a little bit about how Sushdan is a unidirectional state manager and that's like Redux. So what does a unidirectional state manager mean? Well, it means that the data flow in a unidirectional data manager only goes in one way. In order to mutate the store, you have to dispatch a action or call a method on the store that then changes the store. And because you're subscribed to the store, you then get updated. And it only goes in the one direction. The next thing we're gonna look at is Valshio and Valshio is an example of a bi-directional state manager. You can actually just directly set a value and get updated if that value is updated somewhere else. So it's a bi-directional connection to the state manager. If you've heard of MobX, Valshio is very similar, just a little bit smaller. Okay, let's go try out Valshio. Okay, so I've cloned direct Pokemon starter into a new directory called direct Pokemon Valshio and added Valshio to it. And so let's go over and check out Valshio and see what it's about. Well, this is the Valshio NPM page and it shows you that basically we're creating a proxy. So our state is held in this proxy. We use a proxy to create that. And then inside of react, we use the use snapshot hook to connect to that proxy. So in the case of, for example, a counter, we get the snapshot of the state. So that would include count zero. And then when we click, we just add on to the count. We just set the value. And automatically, this component will re-render because we know that we also subscribe to count over here. It's just a really nice way to manage data. Okay, so let's go and create our store based on our proxies and snapshots. So I'm going to bring in proxy from Valshio and we'll create a couple proxies. We'll create the search proxy by saying we have a proxy and the query string is an empty string. And then we also have to have a proxy for all of the Pokemon. So far, so good. And now we know we need to go fetch it. So let's do the fetch work and then get the JSON back from that. And then with that Pokemon, we're just going to set that value. That's all we need to do. We just need to set all Pokemon dot Pokemon to that. And let's see. So, okay, cool. Let's uh, go over to our app.tsx and bring this in. All right, so to use our proxies, we need to use snapshot. So let's bring in use snapshot from Valshio. And then we'll bring in our proxies. from that store. And now let's go get it. So we're going to get a snapshot of the search proxy and we'll use that as the value. And then on the change, we'll just set that value. Search.query equals the event target value. So use snapshot is really what's doing the subscription to that proxy. It's connecting that proxy with react so that when search changes, this use snapshot basically fires, sets some state, that state is given back to us as a snap, and we can then display it. And that's how Valshio fits into the React rendering cycle. In order to set it, you just go and set the value of the proxy directly. So there's a little bit of a differential there. You don't want to just call like search.query because that's not actually going to connect you directly. Okay, so now here with Pokemon list, let's go and get that all Pokemon and get that. And now down here, we can just take the Pokemon from that snap and let's see, are we working? We are, of course, we got crazy numbers of Pokemon because we've got all the Pokemon in the list and we don't search. So how do we fix that? Well, we fix that by using another utility from Valshio called derive and derive allows us to derive data from multiple proxies. So let's bring in derive from the utils. 
And then derive allows us to create a new proxy. So we'll call that Pokemon. And you give it an object. And then with that object, you give it, so I'm gonna call this key list. Now list is a function that takes a getter. And then we can use that getter to get other proxies. So we get the search, get the query from that, convert it to lowercase, and we get all the Pokemon and then filter it based on that query. Pretty cool, right? So now we can get rid of exporting all Pokemon. We can go back over here to app.tsx, change it to Pokemon, change that to Pokemon, and let's see, snap dot, what do we call it again? List. Cool. Hit refresh. B U L B. Oh, hmm. okay. Well, it's not. What's going on here? Oh, okay. Add on to lowercase. Cool. And I think we also slice and sort, right? So let's do the slice. Take the first 10 and then sort. Perfect. Love it. And now we only have the 10. Ah, great. Awesome. How cool is that? I mean, that is a very, very simple state management model. When you set a value, you just set it. And then over here, we just do the same thing with all Pokemon. We just, we just set it. How, how cool is that? And then use that snapshot to go and subscribe to it. That's very clean. And then this derive, I love this. So this ability to just take multiple data sources and derive some data from it dynamically, that is just great. And it automatically updates anytime that search changes or all Pokemon changes, the thing just automatically re-renders. I love that. It's a, another great thing that I love about state managers like this. And along that line, another model of state management that I'm really excited about is called atomic state management. And there's three state managers out there that really define the current state of atomic management. There was the original library recoil from Facebook. There is the Jotai library from Daishikato. Daishikato just happened to also write Valshio and Sustand. So if you want to subscribe to somebody on Twitter and learn all about state, definitely a good follow. And he's also written a great book recently on state management. So you might want to check that out. And also there is nano stores. So those three libraries, Recoil, Jotai, and nano stores are excellent places to look when it comes to atomic state management. I'm going to choose to use Jotai and we're going to go check that out next. All right. So let's take a look at the Jotai atomic state management library and how to use it in the list of directories that is in the GitHub repo associated with this video, there is direct Pokemon Jotai, and this is where this code lives. It's a clone currently of direct Pokemon starter, and we'll just go through it one by one. So let's go over and look at the store. And this is where we're going to start building out our atoms. So what are we talking about here? Well, let's go over to our Jotai page and see how this works. So we bring in Atom, which is how we define a piece of state, and use Atom, which is how we use it in the React context. So for example, you have a text atom that you've created by using atom hello, and then you can have another atom that depends on that atom such that when text atom changes, this uppercase atom will get recomputed to do two uppercase. So again, you're creating this network of data. If you think about like an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, right? You can imagine text atom would be a cell and then uppercase atom would be another cell that references that original cell, but uppercases it. And that's one of the cool things about this atomic state management system is you create this web of state and it just automatically updates itself. And then to interact with it, you use use atom, give it the atom that you want to talk to. And then you get back basically a value and a setter, just like you would with use state. So it's very, very simple. So the first thing we want to do is bring in that atom from Jotai. And let's declare our search atom. Fair enough, easy. But how do we get the list of all the Pokemon? Well, that's actually a little bit cooler and uh, I'm gonna do it a little bit differently than I have with the other ones. So we're gonna use this atoms with query and this allows us to use Tanstack's query core. So it's basically React query now connected to a Jotai atom. So let's go and add these libraries. 
and then start the server up again. And then we import Adam's a query. And now we just need to create an all Pokemon Adam that uses that Adam's a query. So we're saying to Adam's a query that we are getting back a, an array of Pokemon. We give it a function, you give it a query key, just like we did with use query before, where you give it a unique key for your query, in this case, Pokemon, and you give it a function, just like we did before with use query. Now we're giving it that exact same fetch function to go get that data, and that gives us back all Pokemon. And so let's try this out. So we got our search and we got our all Pokemon. That's probably enough to get started. So let's go over here to app.tsx and bring this in. We'll bring in use Adam from Jotai. And we'll also bring in use Adam value. Use Adam value just subscribes to the value of the Adam. So we'll use Adam, the original, which is just like use state to go and get the search Adam because we're going to want to set and get that. And we'll use Adam value for the all Pokemon because all we want to do is just get the value of that. Now let's get our atoms from that store. And then for the search box, let's use that. Set the value. And then here with the event, set that search. Good enough. Now with the atom value, we're going to go get our Pokemon. on the all Pokemon Atom, and then we just display it. Hit save, go back over to our display, and Bob's your uncle. Nice, but no searching. So we need to go and create an Atom that looks at both the all Pokemon Atom and the search Atom, and when either of those changes, updates itself. So let's go and create a Pokemon Atom that depends on both of those things. So in this case, we give it a function. That function takes a getter. And with that, we can get the current value of the search atom by just getting the search atom, the current value of all Pokemon by getting the all Pokemon. And we just filter. So let's go make this to lowercase. And then we'll use to lowercase in there. And now we've got our Pokemon atom. So let's go and get rid of that export because we don't need that and go over to our app and bring in the Pokemon Atom. Let's call it that. Let's get it out of the way. And then down here, all Pokemon becomes Pokemon Atom. Hit save, hit refresh. B-U-L-B. -B. Nice. Perfect. Wow, that's cool. But you know what? I, I, I do like this cascade model. And currently we're just filtering, but we also want to slice and we want to sort. So let's create another atom that depends on Pokemon atom that has that. So it takes the existing Pokemon atom and then it sorts it. Based on the name and oh, we also got to slice it. Cool. And I've got a sorted Pokemon Atom. And we can go back over here to our app, bring that in instead, and depend on that. Now let's see, does it work? Yeah, Blastoise started out. Okay, B U L B. Cool. And also, is it? Yep, it's trimming down to 10. How cool is that? So now we can see that we have this cascade of atoms in the store. We've got our search atom, which is basically a simple piece of text. And then we got our all Pokemon atom, which is an asynchronous atom that is based on tan stack query. It goes off, makes that query and then sets itself. And that automatically integrates with the other atoms such that when it updates, any dependent atoms get updated, which includes this Pokemon atom, which subscribes to both the search atom and also the all Pokemon atom. It then returns for its own sake, the filtered version of that data. So this is how you derive in this Jotai or recoil or nano stores type system. And then we have another atom that listens to Pokemon atom. And so you, when you, any of these things update, like the search updates, you get this awesome automatic cascade. And the thing that I really like about it 
is is that cascade and it is slightly different from the native react version of that because we already we kind of have that in the native react system right we've got use state and use reducer which are effectively atom and then we have use memo which is basically a way of deriving another atom from the original atom the only problem is that based on the nature of react we have to manage the dependency arrays notice that we don't have to do that here by getting the atom we're automatically subscribing to it which is a much much cleaner way to work and you don't have to worry about the fact that you might have dependency arrays that might not have all of the stuff in it that you actually need so it removes another potential for error the next and last direct state manager we're going to take a look at is the venerable redux so I realize getting to Redux at pretty much the end of the video is kind of like walking a whole marathon and then saying, hey, here's Everest. It's just a little bit at the end. No big deal. Redux is a huge state management ecosystem, essentially. Redux is the longest surviving React state manager. It's been around since the days of class-based components and probably actually even before that. And I got to say, it, it can be a little daunting. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Redux toolkit to simplify it a little bit. Redux toolkit gives you a bunch of helpers on top of Redux that reduces a lot of the boilerplate, which is a lot of folks gripes with Redux is that there's a lot of boilerplate. It also has a React query equivalent built right into it. So that's pretty cool. So we will use that to go and get our data for us. So this is the Redux toolkit. And I've created our app. Our app is in the direct Pokemon Redux folder. And it is just a clone of the direct Pokemon starter, as we do with all of these. Now, this is what we're going to add to the code. We're going to add Redux, which is the base library for Redux. We're going to add React Redux, which is the couplers basically between React and Redux, basically just hooks. And the Redux toolkit, which as I said, is the, the simplifying stuff, simplifying functions that allow us to really easily create stores and slices. So we'll get into that, what that is in a second. Let me start up the server. and then bring it up and we got our search box. Awesome. Okay, so let's go over here to our store. And so what are we gonna do? We're gonna create a Redux store and our Redux store is going to have slices in it. So now when Redux first started, the idea was that you'd have one ginormous store that would have all of your data in it. And folks got to the point where they're like, hey, that doesn't scale really well because of having one big store with all the data in it for the entire application, people will start running over each other. And so and slice is a way to slice the data into parts and pieces so that you can manage it better. So let's bring in a few imports from Redux Toolkit. The first would be create slice. So we're gonna create a slice to hold our search state. So this is just gonna be the search. This is gonna be the text string of the search and also a way to set the search. So we're gonna create a slice. That slice name is gonna be called search. The initial value, the initial state of this slice is just going to be a search with an empty string in it. And then we're going to have our reducers. So we talked about reducers when it came to use reducer. This is a set of functions, each one of which is effectively a reducer. In this case, we've got a set search and it takes a state and an action. And the little difference here with Redux toolkit versus traditional Redux is that in traditional Redux, you would return a state where that particular value is mutated, but the rest of it would be the same, but you'd return an entirely new state with all you know new keys. Whereas in this case, Redux Toolkit has made it a little bit easier in that you can just go set the values in the state, and then it does the merging of your changes with the original state. And this is actually fairly con, and this is actually fairly controversial in Redux world, as far as I know. I'm not a huge Redux person, honestly, but you know, I'm gonna give you the best I got here. So, okay. So this search slice has gotten us a lot of stuff. So let's take a look. Search slice has in it actions and a reducer and a name. So we're gonna export out of here, 
the action for set search coming out of actions. And now we got to configure a store that has that reducer in it. So we're going to use the configure store. It's going to give us back a store that we're going to export. And we're just going to give it that reducer from the search. So that is how we register each slice into the overall store. Now, if you do store.getState, which you can do from anywhere, you can do it externally to Redux, you can do it inside the React tree. This is all not connected to React right now. You get the state. So that would include search.search because it's the search slice and within that the search value. And so the root state of this store is the type of the output of get state, what I just looked at. So if we do command K command I on that, we can see that our root state has the search slice and within that the search value. And then finally, we want to make a selector. So we talked about selectors in the, in the case of Zustand. Selectors allow you to go and take a store and get out just the data that you want for the particular component. So we want to create selectors for everything that we need. So in this case, we're going to create select search, and that's going to give us back the selector, the value for the search, current value for the search. Okay, so let's go over to our app.tsx and start wiring this up to the search box. So to do that, we bring in a couple of things from React Redux. Now I mentioned that React Redux are the hooks that connect Redux to React. So here are the things that we need to bring in. We need to bring in a use selector. That's a hook that given a selector goes and gets the data based on that selector. Use dispatch just gives you a dispatch function for the current store that you call to dispatch actions. Just like we did with use reducer, use the state and use dispatch, use dispatch exactly the same way with Redux, which is why folks kind of think like, oh, Redux, Redux became use reducer. It's not that easy, but yeah, yeah. I mean, some of these concepts are very similar, like for example, dispatch. And then the provider, and the provider is a context. You give it a store, and then it provides that store down to these hooks. So let's bring in that store from the local store. And then let's provide that. I mean, I love how Redux is so, so old and it's been around for so long that the provider is literally named provider. It's amazing. Like other, other state management libraries, they have, you know, Redux or whatever, you know, library name provider or whatever query provider, whatever have you. This one is just, it's provider. It's just provider. You could rename it if you want, but that's what comes out of the library. And I think it's amusing. Okay. So we got our store and now we want to go get a use selector to go and get the search value. So we need to bring in that selector for search. So we need to use that selector and give it that select search. And then we also need to get a dispatcher. So we just call use dispatch and get our dispatcher. And that just basically grabs it from the context and brings it in. Okay, so this becomes the value of search and dispatch. We're just going to dispatch a set search with the event target value. So we need to bring in event right here. And let's see, actually, let's uh, go and set this to a value first. So foo, let's see what we've got. Hey, how's that? And it looks like it's working. That's great. So we've got our slice for the search part of our global store. So now the next thing we want to do is we want to get the Pokemon JSON. And that means bringing in the query part of Reux toolkit. So we're going to bring in the create API and fetch base query functions from the toolkit query. So that's the query part. And then the react version of the query. So again, with Redux, like everything is sort of, there's the, the basic and then there's the react. Uh, okay, so we want to go and do is we want to build out our create API for our Pokemon JSON. So what we do is we invoke that create API. We give it our path, so Pokemon API. We give it the fetch base query. So we tell, say that everything that we do with this particular API is going to be off of slash, and it's only going to have one endpoint, and that endpoint is get Pokemon, and that is going to call query with Pokemon JSON. So we're going to get basically 
you know, slash Pokemon JSON there. In fact, let's get rid of that. Yeah, that looks a little better. Okay. Okay, now let's take a look at what's in Pokemon API. So inside Pokemon API, we have our endpoints. Within that, we've got get Pokemon. And within that, we have our use query. How cool is that? It's automatically created a use query for us. So let's go and actually export that. So we have our use Pokemon query. And we'll just export that. Take a look over here, bring it in over here. And now we can use it. And we'll give it no parameters because there's nothing going in. And the output here is either an array of Pokemon or undefined. So let's just say that if we have put data, then let's use it. And if we don't, then we'll use the empty array. All right, mm, not working. Oh, I remember what it was. Okay, more wiring to be done. Okay, so we've got this Pokemon API. We need to go bring this down here and add it as a reducer. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yes, we have Redux and it's going. I love it. Okay, so now we have a you know, bulb or whatever. Cool. So let's say that we want to go and trim that down. Well, if you look at the docs, the docs tell you at this point, if you want to derive some data, one way to do it would just be to integrate this with an existing tool that allows you to listen to data and then derive data from that. And what tool do we have for that? Well, we have good old use memo. So we can use parts of our existing React native hook set and integrate them with what we have from Redux. So let's bring in use memo and see how this works. So we want to filter and we want to sort the data based on the search. So let's first get the search, right? Need that. So we want to filter and we want to sort the Pokemon. And it's going to rely on the data as well as the search. And we're going to return out of this the data or an empty array, if it exists, because it might not exist, might be null, filtered by that name. Of course, we want to do our little two lowercase thing. And then we want to slice it. And then we want to sort it. Nice. Okay. So that'll give us our filtered and sorted Pokemon or an empty array. So we don't have to go check for it anymore. Let's hit save and see if it works. So it's giving us 10. That's great. And let's see, B U L B. Nice. Perfect. Okay. So that is one way to do it. Another way to do it is to actually start the request for Pokemon JSON externally to the app and then create a selector over in the store that listens for when that data is done and then looks to see if it can take that data from the search and do the same thing, but do it over on the store side. So we're basically creating a selector that's doing that kind of work for us. So let's bring in a create selector function. And then we will create a selector. And the first parameters to create selector are a set of functions that select out parts and pieces. You can have as many as you want, apparently. And the first part gives us our Pokemon. So we're gonna get our data from Pokemon API endpoints, get Pokemon, select, undefined. That's the parameter that we put in. And then the state, could we get the state coming in off the root date, state, and we get the data. Whew, okay. And then we can go and take this basically and drop it in here. So we're going to take that Pokemon and filter it on that search value. So this could be undefined. So let's go handle that. All right, cool. So select Pokemon. I like it. So let's see. Now let's go over here to our app. And instead of using that use memo, 
we are instead going to just select out Pokemon based on that select Pokemon. Selector, okay, and Pokemon. Okay, let's give it a try. So nothing. So why is that? Well, we've gotten rid of the query that we did. We used to do this use Pokemon query and give it undefined and that initiated the query. So now we have to initiate the query over here in the store. And the way that we do that is pretty much anywhere. We can do store.dispatch, which is again, nice because you can talk to Redux both in the React context as well as in the external to React context. And then we want to call that Pokemon API with the endpoint of the get Pokemon where we initiate it with that undefined. All right, let's give it a try. Hey, hey. okay. Now what's happening is externally to react. We are initiating the fetch of the Pokemon JSON here. And then when the store updates, because that get Pokemon returns a value, it's then stored in our store and that store changing then updates any subscribers. It looks to see what the selector is selecting out. In this case, the selector is looking at the output of the get Pokemon as well as the search. And then using the two to select out a mutated version of the Pokemon list where we've filtered it and sliced it and sorted it. So you can use selectors for more than just selecting data. You can actually mutate the data in the store and the selector is actually the right place to do that in this model. Okay. So one more thing that people love about this is the Redux tools. So if I go here over here, Redux, we can see that as I type, we are setting the search and you can see all of the different actions. And this is because I have the Redux dev tools installed in my Chrome and I'm in dev mode. And so that's automatically registered those things together. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So you can see like the, the pending query, you can see the fulfilled query with the data. It's pretty neat, you know, and you can also do this cool, like time travel debugging that people think is really slick. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So there you have it. So Redux, of course, all the code is available to you in GitHub in the link in the description down below. And of course, in this, this one is in the direct Pokemon Redux directory. Now, before we get to wrapping all this up, I do want to talk about one more technical thing. Check this out. So times they are changing in react land. And one of the biggest changes has been a recent RFC or request for comment that would add first class support for promises to react. And the way that you do that is kind of different in the client side code versus the server side code. So in the client side code, you now have this ability to use a new hook called use that you give it a promise. And then when that promise is fulfilled, you get the data from that promise, or I guess you get undefined in the meantime. So let's try this out because I think it's worth knowing about. This is not out there 100% yet. It is in the experimental build of react as well as in Next.js 13. So it, it definitely is coming. There might be some changes between now and when it actually gets out there, but I think it's worth knowing because it will fundamentally change how we do state management in React going forward. It adds a lot of new functionality, but also could replace some existing functionality that we have. So I'll let you be the judge. So let's uh, go over to the terminal and we'll do another create V app. And we'll call this one native use. And you know what? I'm just going to use just basic react, not TypeScript for this, bring it up in VS code. And now let's go over to the package.json. And in order to get onto this new experimental build, I need to change the react and react DOM versions to experimental. And then do my yarn and my yarn dev. And so I now have our app. Cool. All right. 
So let's go and try this out. So I'm going to go create a new file in public called data.json. It's going to have some basic data in it. And what we want to do is we want to go get that data. So we're going to go over here to our app.jsx and let's see, we can get rid of everything basically. So how would we do this before? Well, we do this before by having some use state and we'd have a use effect and we'd use the use effect to go get the fetch or we'd use react query and SWR as we've seen, but now we can do something really cool. We can basically just create a request here. And what do we say? Data.json. And then we'll get the JSON out of that. So now we have this promise just kind of floating out in space with our data. So let's bring in use. And then we can just get our data by using that promise. And let's stringify that and see how it goes. How cool is that? That's really neat. That being said, if you want to see a browser freak out, watch this. So, I mean, come on, right? Why, why not just go and put that in here? It's like that. I mean, duh, it's, it'd be a lot easier. So get rid of that, hit save, hit refresh. And now nothing happens, but lots of stuff's happening in our Dev tools, we're going and getting data.json a whole bunch. So why is that? Well, what's happening here, and let me actually stop our, all right. So what's happening here is that we run app. App then first starts off a fetch that returns a new promise. And we use that promise. We get the data back, the data starts at null or undefined or whatever, and we put that out. And then finally, this fetch actually resolves and we get our data. Use picks up on that because added a then to it and it gets the data and it returns it. Cool. That in turn re renders app. And you, and then we create another fetch. Now it's exactly the same fetch. And I know, I know, I know that's frustrating because it's exactly the same fetch doing exactly the same thing, but it's a new reference to a new promise to a new fetch, even though that is doing exactly, exactly, exactly the same thing. It is a different promise. So use again says, Oh, well, give me a new promise. Cool. All right. I'll go wait for that one. And so we get is an infinite loop. Every data JSON resolves, gets us some data and it's so fast that it never even gets to the point where React can actually get enough spare time to put anything up on the screen. That's why we don't even get anything on the screen in this case. And that's why I initially created the promise at the top level here, because that means that there will only be the one, the one promise that gets resolved. Now we can go back over to our local host and it works. Cool. So there you go. So that's use now on the server side of the house. It actually is a little bit different again. So if we take a look over here at the first class support. If you look for the server stuff, await in server components. And the idea now is that you can have a component that is server side rendering only, in this case called note, that can await data right in the function. You can create this component asynchronously. This is cool. This is huge. This is something that we never had before in react is an async function and react will wait for this function to resolve because it's a promise and we can await it. And once it's done, then the server will render the page and give it out. So this is really cool. And I think there's a lot of potential here. It certainly is game changing in terms of how it will change state management in react. For the better, for the worse, don't know. We'll see as Next.js 13 becomes more prominent, but it is very cool and it is certainly worth keeping up with. So in summary, let me give you some advice on how I think you should decide technology choices when it comes to state management in React. I think first and foremost for local state, you should endeavor to use native state management, use state, use reducer, 
use memo, use callback. At the point where you get to use effect, you might want to think about using a third party library, something like a React query or an SWR, because those libraries are going to probably do a better job at managing queries than you would potentially do building it on your own. Those are just great libraries. They've got refetching, they've got mutations. This is fantastic stuff, and they're definitely good to be leveraged. And I think a combination of native state management plus React Query and maybe get server-side props if you're in the next JS world might be enough for average applications to manage the state. And then if you have additional needs, in particular, to allow for global state. So you've got different parts of the React tree and you need to get state from one place to another, then you can either look at doing context. If you have state that's fairly slow moving, I think that's a good opportunity to move state around using context. Or you can use something like a Zustand or a Jotai or Valshio or Redux, as we've seen, and there are lots of different options in that space, but I think I've shown you some of the best. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have any questions or comments after all this, be sure to put that in the comment section down below. And if you like the video, hit that like button. And if you really like the video, head on over to my channel and subscribe to it because I do videos, well, not this long, but I do good videos and they come out every couple of weeks or so. I think you'll enjoy them. Certainly if you're a react dev, it's worth the subscribe. It's free. See you next time.